I mean, that's the money. I went to adjust my soprano mouthpiece just to turn it a little bit to the left. It was a little too, a little too slanted to the right. And in so doing, I snapped the metal ligature. And I'm supposed to rehearse today and have some, some pieces to play on soprano. I don't have a backup ligature. I checked. a little too big. Apparently, I don't have another soprano ligature. So that's a bummer for multiple reasons. I mean, I don't, do I just leave this on here indefinitely? I mean, at least for today, it still works. Kind of a bummer too, though. I've, I've played this exact ligature since college. My whole time touring with John Mayer, where I probably got to play the most soprano, sort of professionally, publicly. This was the ligature that I used on all those shows. Not that not it, it matters, it doesn't really matter. It's just a ligature. It's just uh, now that it's broken. Anyway, the point of this video is to just love on this Branford Marsalis solo over Roxanne in this duet performance with Sting. It's gonna be this month's official transcription challenge for those in the virtual studio. By the way, the virtual studio, that's where I teach every month along with lessons and practice roadmaps and courses and all that stuff. We do a monthly challenge and I review members' submissions at the end of the month. If you wanna find out more about that, there will be a link in the description or maybe in here. I open it a couple times a year and it's very interactive. It's gonna open up again this month. So this solo is not something that I can say in, in this exact solo influenced me, but it's emblematic of their work together, which had a huge impact on me and, and sort of served as my blueprint for definitely the work I went on to do with John. But beyond that, just Branford's way of playing in, in Sting's band and in pop music in general, for me, it's just, it doesn't get better. It, it's it's absolute perfection. He's probably, I mean, he and Chris Potter have my favorite soprano sax sounds, but Branford is, his soprano playing is just, anyway, it's amazing. And there's so much to wonderful stuff to discover in this solo. So I'm just going to walk you through things that are popping to mind as I listen to it and play through it. Uh, I guess we should maybe just check out the harmony first. For this part, I'll speak in concert key. So the song is in G minor, two flats, the relative minor of concert B flat major. Otherwise known as the Aeolian mode, pure minor, sixth mode of B flat major. And what I want you to keep in mind as we go through this is one of the reasons I'm always preaching about just the benefit of really having command of your major scales not just as scales, but as diatonic triads and seventh chords. So for instance, in B flat here, if we just map this all back to B flat. Or. The ability to do that, you know, with all of your major scales, by just focusing on that, you're, you're what, at least 7xing your knowledge of chords and scales within that. So here's the harmony. It's beautifully simple. I'll just play it with three note voicings. G minor, D minor over F. Come back to that in a moment. E flat major 7, D minor 7, C minor 7, F7 sus, G sus. 
and then the chorus is just C minor, F7 sus, G sus, I think. I mean, I, I could be wrong, there could be more in there, but that's the, the gist of the song, of what's going on there. That's the meat of it. Now back to that, the top part, G minor. If I just kind of walked down diatonically keeping the same um, shape, look what we would get. We would get G minor and the next step down would be F. And that sounds so hollow. So parallel. But by instead getting an inversion here, so we get the everything moving except the middle note. That one note makes such a difference, doesn't it? And then you have, you know, a major seven chord with, in the melody, A natural, so sharp 11. Um, so we're getting these seventh chords, but again, it's all diatonic and modal. And this ain't part kind of leaves us hanging, a little bit ambiguous. It's still minor. But we hear the change from sus to minor. So, very cool, beautiful, sophisticated, elegant, just like Branford's solo. So I'm gonna go through this solo and I'm just gonna stop and start a lot. And also I'm gonna speak in B flat key. So everything I would talk about note wise is the notes as they are on the soprano or a tenor or a trumpet, which is a whole step above concert. Roxanne, you don't have to put on the red lights. First thing to notice, Branford has not played anything in the first verse. This is pretty typical. You might call it a, a good rule of thumb. Nobody ever told it to me or taught it to me in school, but I just you know picked it up intuitively from years of listening to people do this well. You know, whether it was literally whether it was Kenny G with Michael Bolton or Branford with Sting, you know, you just hear, or I mean you could think of all sorts of examples. Just don't play in the first verse. All right, wait till the second verse. Now listen to Branford's entrance in the second verse. I love this. You don't have to wear that dress. I love this four note cell. Mainly the, the first part of it. So the way I think of that cell is a major triad with the addition of the fourth scale degree. So coming from the root, in this case G, G, B, C, and D. Those are the four notes but the phrase begins on four. So four, three, one, five. In fact, I like this phrase so much. I mean, think of it how you could use it over C major in this case. So C, B, G, D, one, seven, five, nine. If it was A minor, then those same notes become flat three, nine, flat seven, 11. If it was F major seven, sharp 11, those notes become five, Sharp 11, 9, 13. I even wrote a song around this phrase called Summer Light. It's on my first album, Can't Wait for Perfect. a different key, but it's. Anyway, I love that phrase. He uses it beautifully. One thing we'll notice throughout is how elegant Branford is with everything, but especially with grace notes, his judicious use of grace notes. And he doesn't overhype them. They're not, it's not, There's not a lot of that. It's clean. Another thing I love, wide interval leaps, especially in a diatonic context. I use this all the time, all over the place. Too many places to cite examples. Um, members of my virtual studio will, will know that I refer to this sometimes as 
seventh on sevenths or flipping a major seventh on its head. So this is going to be a little bit cumbersome to talk about, but what he's doing there is E, F, E, D. So you get that major seventh in there between the F and the E. But if you, I mean, think about how that would be over E major, excuse me, over F major seven. Seven, one, seven, six. But if it's over D minor, it becomes nine flat three, nine, one. Or if it's over G seven, it becomes 13 flat seven, 13 five. But what it does is it serves to, this is like, um, sorry, I know this is gonna be on YouTube, but I'm referencing some stuff for the virtual studio members. That lesson we did on Chris Potter's uh, solo on El Morocco with the wide interval leaps, same thing. Those wide interval leaps, they help really just kind of bring, breathe new life into a diatonic context. And this whole song is diatonic. This whole thing comes from modes of B-flat major concert. So C for the B-flat uh, instruments. This right. Just a touch of vibrato, hear it? Right there, right there on that F. And then a scale fall beautifully down to that B. And I love what he's doing here because Sting's going, Roxanne, D, A. So like that's a fourth, just a, you know, it doesn't tell you about the harmony, whether it's major or minor. Is it D major or is it D minor, right? The, the melody doesn't describe it, but Branford does by, by choosing those notes the way he does. He goes, uh, nine flat three. And then each time he does it, he comes down, he falls down from that a little bit differently each time. You don't have to put on the red light. Slight embellishment. So the first time he falls down to B. And the second time he goes all the way down to G. Just a little change. Also that the uh, sort of prelude to that, he doesn't cheese it up. There's no cheese balling here ever. You'll never get that with Branford. That's what I love. It's just so clean and elegant and sophisticated always. But especially when we're talking about Branford's soprano playing and more especially his soprano playing with Sting. It's just the gold standard, in my opinion. Think of how cheesy that could have been. I, I'm gonna fool around here a little bit, joking, because this is, this is real stuff. People do this, it's not my taste, and that's fine if it is your taste. It's not my taste, which is why I'm drawn to Branford, because he doesn't do that stuff. But, you know, you could really abuse a moment like this and uh, just over gild the lily, but he does not do that. You don't have to put on the red light. I love you since I knew you. I would have talked down to you. Why does the audience go nuts there? What is it? Well, they recognize that he's now echoing Sting's melody and he's not doing it exactly, right? He's just, let's see, maybe I'm wrong about that. Let's see. Love you since I knew you. And then Branford goes. Well, maybe he does do this. He does, my bad, he echoes it exactly. So he echoes Sting's melody in that space, this call and response, it's just beautiful. Imagine if he'd played just something else, which is fine, I guess, but there's a power here and just what, he makes these choices and these choices are powerful. Let's listen to it again. So beautiful and vocal. No. 
It's, uh, it's as much about where he doesn't add a grace note as where and when he does. So just pay attention to that. To you. Have... Now there he doesn't continue mimicking exactly what Sting does. So you just really have that one moment that it's a pure echo or reflection. So there's a lot again where he's playing around with this G major triad over this harmony. So tell you just how I feel. I will share you with another boy. Love this too. You know my mind is made up. So oh, so not only does he copy the notes, but listen to how Sting lays back the melody, the phrase, and then Branford does the exact same thing. It's so vocal, and that's what makes it so magical. You know my know my mind is made up. It just each note comes a, or falls a little bit further behind the beat. You know my mind is made up. So Woo, so laid back. So he's creating something here where now we're back to this chorus and he's playing basically the same thing he did the first time around. So it provides some continuity. He's not always playing something different. This gives us as the listener, you know, again, this is all just my opinion, but it, to me, when I hear it, it provides a little contrast. He's not just the guy up there noodling. noodling. He's not always playing different stuff every moment. There's, there's some things for us to hang our hat on as listeners. And this harmonizing with Sting on the chorus is one of them. Okay, this solo. I don't, I, it's been a minute. I don't, I know it, I don't know it. I'm gonna mess it up, but I'm gonna play along to see. Let's try that again. He starts. Listen to this. Listen to the difference between a half step grace note and a whole step. Half step, now whole step. So, you know, it's a choice. Again, they're different. Okay, I love this. How he hits that G to A again. I mean, that's the money part right there. It's all great, but that moment when he gets to that double time, ah, it's incredible. I mean, why is it so incredible? It's all diatonic. I mean, first it's incredible because of how it feels. Forget the notes. It, the first thing that strikes me is the pitch is perfect. There's no bendies or weirdness. Everything is just, each note is where it lives. It's exactly the right spot, but the time, it's the bounce. The rhythm is primary. Right? I forget the line now, but that's the it's, it's like a, almost like a legato percussiveness to it, but that's the thing I always come back to is how it feels. Now, when we put the notes in, it's mostly like A minor pentatonic or C pentatonic. However, he uses one colorful note. He dips in 
so we, we go from like being in C major to A minor, relative minor, and he uses that harmonic minor scale there, which we're talking about this month in those exercises in the studio, but... Right, so... And that's why you, you know, beyond the obvious reason, that's why practically you want to have full and complete access to all your major scales, your melodic minor, and your harmonic minor scales. And this is a perfect example of that harmonic minor scale just being beautifully slipped in there. One note, the G sharp, to provide a leading tone in the minor context, G sharp up to A. But otherwise it's all diatonic. What is so amazing about that part? I always come back to how he builds higher into the phrase and then he, instead of bending into that high note, instead of attacking it, he starts down in the bottom of the horn and plays an elegant scale. I know I'm overusing that word, but it, I, don't, I don't know what else to say. He plays the scale you know, from the bottom of the horn right up to that. I mean, it, if you want to talk about what scale it is, it's a Phrygian scale, but I, I wouldn't think of it that way. I'm just thinking of it as like a C major scale starting on E. So, uh. instead of, I'm, I'm just trying to provide an, uh, a counter example of like another way you could have hit that note that would just be way less killing. So. right back into that chorus part that we have already come to uh, expect now. This is the third time and he delivers. So it's really obvious for every, all these listeners, like, okay, we're in the chorus, he's doing this. We're in the verse, he's doing this. Here's the solo. Yeah, it's just, it really furthers the story of the song and the situation. I just can't say enough good things about it. It's just uh, a masterpiece in my opinion. <laughs> I wanted to point that out also. Again, here we come back to just a, a, a simple G major triad, but in an, in an inversion. Another reason why you wanna have full and complete access to your triads throughout the whole range of the horn uh, because, you know, the, once you understand, once you have command of triads, you could just use them in infinite ways. I mean, we, that's a whole, we could spend a week talking about that. You don't have to put on the red And the whole thing is just held together so beautifully and so, it's just, it, it, yeah, I mean.
again, note the underwhelming use of vibrato. I, I just mean that underwhelming in that he is not overusing it, okay? He's not just vibra vibratoing up every other note, which is so common, I hear that all the time. No need for that. But then when it is there, it's very special. Anyway, I love this solo, this accompaniment. It's just fantastic. Like I said, it was a huge, well, not this solo exactly, because this was in 2007. I was already touring with, with John Mayer in those days, but previous work of theirs together, Branford and Sting, was such an important blueprint for me in, uh, you know, especially in that context of me playing soprano in John Mayer's group. This 100% is the, is the foundation or the blueprint of that. Um, and it's just a, I think, a, a case study, a roadmap for elegance and sophistication playing the saxophone in a pop setting. So have fun with that. Um, it's, I mean, how could you not? Well, I hope that was helpful, or at the very least, interesting. If you want to check out a lot more like this, head over to bobsvirtualstudio.com. Again, that's opening up this month, and you can download a free copy of my 7T Jazz Practice Framework, which is just a tool that I use to help me organize what I'm going to practice. See you in the next one.